Welcome to the Peaceful Podcast, your home for honest discussion about war, peace, and freedom of conscience. Here are your hosts, Justin and Jessica Pavoni. And welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on the Seeds of Liberty uh, podcast and also uh, theconsciousresistance.com. So today we have Jessica Pavoni, who is an anarchist, uh, former Air Force pilot turned conscientious objector, now is the uh, infamous Anarcho Mama, uh, founder and blogger at libertybug.org. Uh, you can find her on Facebook. Uh, uh, under Liberty Bug and also Twitter. The name is Liberty Bug, but it's at, at Anarcho Mama. So just to confuse you. Uh, <laughs> so she. Uh, so, so we'll discuss you know, her history in the military, uh, which coincides also with how she became an anarchist and, uh, and then how she became a conscientious, conscientious objector. And, uh, and, she, and uh, her blog series, uh, Are You Really Free? Um, and also she's a mother of two. So, uh, you know, I, I never... Um, overlook the the opportunity to talk about peaceful parenting <laughs> with anyone. So hopefully we'll get into that. Um, so Jessica, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. It's a great honor. Yeah, I saw you on the uh, or you and your husband. I heard you on the Tom Woods show, and uh, you know I thought this was a great story. You know, it's so awesome to hear people. Um, you know, not only how they became anarchists, but but when you're in the military, which is like, you know, it it really fascinates me because it's like. That's like um, an environment of like extreme nationalism, you know, Mm -hmm. and how do you go from that extreme all the way to the (laughs) other end of, you know, anarchy? It's really amazing. And then to turn around and and not only come back to anarchy or come around to anarchy, but but then become an active proponent of it and, and, you know, write about it and talk about it. And so I really uh, respect all of (laughs) you people who have done this. So thank you. Thank you for your service. (laughs) Ah, gosh, <laughs> that's a that's an interesting phrase. Maybe we could talk about in a little bit because it's just loaded with. Well, I meant thank you for your service as okay. coming around that's- to anarchy. No, 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 no. <laughs> you misunderstood me. <laughs> well, you have to understand um, anytime somebody finds out that you were in the military at some point, they say, thank you for your service. Yeah, naturally. Yeah. Yeah. It's just such a loaded statement for me. Um, you're right, you're right. I'd like to start a hashtag one day that says thanks but no thanks and just yeah. write out all the things that I think in my head but might not say <laughs> as right. a response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's definitely what I meant. <laughs> Maybe it was confusing because yeah. I, I started with all that. But no, thank you for now being a proponent yeah. for liberty and freedom and free markets and stuff like you're that. You're welcome. The good you're stuff. Welcome. The good stuff. You can see I'm still conditioned. <laughs> I think I think most of us are. I mean, I think, you know, so many times I catch myself thinking yeah. in status terms or collectivist terms and people kind of, you know, snap me out of it. And uh, and it's it's kind of um, it's interesting. I think, you know, 12 years of mm-hmm. growing up in in a public school system or a government school system, better will said mm-hmm. um, it's hard to break that. You know, it's not easy. Yeah. It's reading a couple books. You're not going to break that. You know, it's years and years and years. So, yep. <laughs> it's a process so yeah so please um get into your your history and in the military and um you know and, and your evolution as an anarchist and how you came to that conclusion sure um i'll try to keep it the relatively short version but growing up um i was your typical kid i guess never really thought much about politics or philosophy uh, my family is republican uh, we're mexican italian so catholicism was a, a big part of my upbringing as well. But uh, I had never really just had an, you know, when I was a kid, I was busy playing sports and going to school and, you know, working a high school job and stuff. Uh, When it came time to graduate, I was a senior in high school when 9-11 had happened. So obviously, you know, everybody remembers that day. And it was very influential uh, in my thinking. At that point, the Air Force Academy had started recruiting me to play soccer. And uh, and then 9-11 happened, and I thought, I, I want to take part in this. You know, there's a fight coming. I want in on it. You know, mm. we've been uh, – a horrible injustice has occurred, and I want to do what I can to make it right. And 
um, those were basically my my two motivating factors for for joining the military in the first place. I didn't come from a military family. We didn't really have much experience with it at all, but I thought, you know, this is a great way for me to get an education and do something about this horrible, uh, you know, crime that has just occurred. Um, so, you know, I went off to the academy eight months later and went through basic training. That was four years at school, got a degree and managed to get a pilot slot, which was also something that I didn't grow up wanting to be. Um, I think like most pilots, I know that's been a, an end state for a long time. And I went through pilot training. That's a year. Um, and if you have any questions about like any of this, feel free to yeah. interrupt me. No problem. But throughout, you know, all this time, you know, that four years at the academy, one year of pilot training, um, my thoughts never really changed. I guess I would still consider myself Republican, uh, very much a statist. Um, I voted for Bush. <laughs> hey, we all have our sins, you know. I, I voted for Obama <laughs> in 2008, so... <laughs> Yeah, so um, I just <laughs> I never had put much thought into it. I was just you know fed the normal line and and bought it just like everybody else. And I was just trying to do the best I could um, with whatever opportunities I had been given. So went to pilot training, uh, graduated, and I became a a pilot for something called Special Operations Command. So. Uh, in the Air Force, there are different commands. There's the transport command, and these are the big airplanes, so they're flying people and stuff around. And there's fighter command, which is where you've got all your small, fast jets that, you know, carry a bunches of bombs and missiles. Um, the stuff to help people, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> drop, drop food and drop medical supplies, right? Okay. So that would be, <laughs> that would be the transport uh, um, command. The one I was in, Special Operations Command, is where you're going to find your... Um, Navy SEALs or your Army Rangers or your Air Force paratroopers and they're you know specialized for certain missions and you know ideally are only used in, in certain cases so uh, my job there was to, to fly an airplane that had um, quite a few missions and a lot of top secret stuff that we won't get into but basically um, it was an ISR platform so ISR stands for Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance and we had a couple big cameras on the on the airplane and our job was to be watching people, watching places and facilitating, you know, raids and airstrikes. Mm. So, um, <laughs> I did that for, um, a long time and this is very odd to say, but I, I loved it. You know, while I was still in this mindset of, um, you know, America's on the right side, we're doing the right thing, you know, being in the military is a, a patriotic, you know, selfless sacrifice, you know, until I had been exposed to something differently, it was like a great fit. Like I loved flying, airplanes are fun, you're with wonderful people, and you're running these high stakes missions. I mean, there's um, a lot of times people ask me, you know, what are you going to miss about the military? Or what are you going to miss about flying? And I think for me, it's the intense situation where you have eight radios going, 50 dudes on the ground, eight other airplanes in the air with you, and like you're running this, um, and it's on you, and the stakes are high, and there's a lot of pressure, and it's a very intense situation. Um, and I say all that just because the 180 degrees I've turned um, was very surprising to me. I think it was surprising to my family and a lot of my friends if you had told me five years ago that one day <laughs> I would be a conscientious objector advocating for peace and for people to get out of the military and I would have, you know, Anarcho Mama is my name. I would have laughed at you. Um, mm. I, I just couldn't have envisioned it. Who would have built the roads? <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, I don't think I've ever asked that question. It was just like, this is the society that we live in. This is the way it is. And, you know, I'm a cog in the wheel and I'm mm. trying to be the best little cog that I can and I want to do some cool cog stuff, but... <laughs> Um, that's essentially what it, what it was. And, um, so I, I, in that capacity as as a special operations pilot, I deployed eight times, which means I went overseas to other countries eight times. Um, I was in Afghanistan five times, Africa twice, and I went to East Asia once. So for probably the first six deployments or so I was, um, I'm sure you've heard the phrase fat, dumb, and happy. You just no, I never heard that. Okay, so maybe that's a military thing. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Um, so explain. No, yeah. So this is tough because my entire adult life, almost, I've been in the military. So hmm. um, stop me if I if I say something that doesn't make sense. But <laughs> okay. when you're fat, dumb, and happy, it's like the plane's on autopilot. 
you're just clicking along, like things are just getting done. You're not like thinking critically necessary. You're just doing your job and doing your job as, as well as you can. So um, that's what I mean when I say for six of my eight deployments, it was just like, hey, you know, my job's great. You know, my life's good. I'm doing a good job here. I'm progressing. You know, I became an instructor pilot. So that's good. You know, I was getting promoted and um, getting experience and um, doing those sorts of things. And it wasn't until um, Ron Paul's second or sorry, his third attempt to run for the presidency that the first little nutshell started to crack open and I started considering different um, points of view. And um, I'm sorry, I'm kind of rambling a little bit here. The I can't really talk about how I left the military without talking about how I also left my faith because they're very um, parallel in yeah. terms of questioning. So the greatest parallel I can draw is in the military, you, oh, sorry, in a religion, you know, things that can't be explained or that can't be understood by mere mortals are, are known as faith or mysteries or miracles. Mm. And, you know, it's just, Hey, there's, there's something else out there. You can't understand it. Just take it at face value and, or, or just accept it. And for me, I felt like there were a lot of things in the, in the Catholic faith or Christianity that were like that. It's like, well, how do you explain this? How does it make sense? I don't know. It's faith, you know, just take it on faith. Um, I saw a great parallel between that and what I was doing in the military. Um, I remember on one of my first or second deployments, uh, flying over Afghanistan, you know, we're watching this town that's probably at 15,000 feet or something, these, you know, tiny villages, um, at night. I was thinking, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? Like, mm -hmm. By this time, that was 2009, so 9-11 had happened eight years prior, mm -hmm. and we're still there, you know? Um, but I just chalked it up to the same sort of thing. It's like somebody up there has an answer. There's a reason all of this is happening. You're just a very small part of it. Do your part um, and trust that that there is an overall strategy or that there is a good reason at, at the root of this. And um, I think that's how I justified to myself for six deployments worth of flying that you know, the things I can't understand or this doesn't make sense to me. Why are we in this country? Or, you know, why are we defending Marines on the ground in, in Afghanistan? I would reason away by saying, I don't have all the answers. You know, I'm, I'm too low on the wheel. Somebody else does. Um, and at some point it became, you know, being in the military is a matter of life and death. Like the ultimate mission is destroying things and, and killing people. And I came to the conclusion that you know, I, I can't take this on faith. Like I have to know, I have to see firsthand or I have to be able to understand and have all the information in front of me to say like, yes, this is a moral thing to do or a right thing to do. Um, and so it all kind of, all of that questioning kind of started when I read Thomas Paine, <laughs> um, who is one of the most influential um, authors in my life. I read one of his books, The Age of Reason, and he's basically attacking revealed religion and just saying, you know, something has been revealed to you, Danilo, like, okay, maybe it's incumbent upon you to believe it, but Danilo can't come to Jessica and say, Hey, Afghanistan's full of bad people. God says we must go, um, attack the country. Um, basically what Thomas Paine is saying is that revelations are, uh, really only incumbent upon that person to believe. And I felt like the same thing in the military. You can't just come to me and say, this is a mission that needs prosecuting, like go do it. Or, you know, this guy is a bad guy. Like we're going to stage a raid for him tonight. I felt like when it comes to life or death, um, you can't abrogate that moral responsibility, that, that decision-making, like you have to make that yourself. You can't say, Oh, well, somebody told me to do it. Like somebody else somewhere has the answer and has decided that this village needs to be, um, needs to have an airstrike or that this vehicle, you know, needs to be destroyed or, or this person needs to be, um, you know, killed. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's really sobering of course. But, um, for me, those two things were very parallel in terms of how did I consider myself as a person of faith and, if I want to be consistent in my life and I do, then I had to apply that to how I was living too. It's like, well, 
you know, if, if you're not going to stick with the Catholic faith because you, you're doubting Thomas and you need the proof in front of you, like, why are you doing that in, in your military job? Like, why are you accepting things mm-hmm. that aren't um, self-evident, basically? <laughs> um, so it was kind of a long transition. That took a couple years. Um, and then we got introduced to the Ron Paul movement. And he started, he was the first candidate that was saying things that actually jived with what I had experienced overseas. Um, And he kind of got me on his foreign policy uh, because what he was saying and campaigning on was um, completely jiving with what I had experienced. By that time, I, I had deployed quite a few times and I was already pretty convinced that I'm not doing anything constitutional and anything I'm doing is not making life better for people at home. And it's certainly not making life better for the people in these countries. Um, and I'm not even sure that this is in defense anymore. So to hear that from a, a candidate was really eye-opening. Um, he was really the only only person saying that. And, and through Ron Paul, I call him the gateway drug, <laughs> uh, we were both introduced to just so many other uh, thinkers and writers and um, we came across Murray Rothbard and Lou Rockwell and Tom Woods. And it was really a great honor to be on his show <laughs> because, uh, you know, I've been listening to him for years and it's like, ah, oh, this guy thinks we're interesting. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so I, I feel like I'm talking a lot here, so feel free to interrupt me with a question, but it's <laughs> all right. Go ahead. <laughs> well, it's just, it's, it's really hard to sum up such a profound change in your life that takes place over a couple years that really puts you at odds with the community that you're in, like what you've grown up with, um, and puts you in this position where, you know, as long as I've been an adult, we've been at war. Mm-hmm. And so for somebody to to come out and say, this is wrong or what we're doing is is messed up and you shouldn't be doing it. I think that flies in the face of a lot of, um, you know, the conventional opinion. Mm-hmm. Especially, you know, we've got such a support the troops um, sentiment here, which I I love all the people I've served with. You know, they're wonderful, wonderful people. But part of me can't separate the fact that, like, we're also engaged in a in an organization whose ultimate mission is death and destruction. Mm-hmm. You know, like, paint a pretty picture on it. Like, that's still what it is at the end. So, you know. It- if I may uh, interrupt real quick, um, yeah. two things that came to mind when you were yeah. talking was um, one of them was um, how the use of euphemisms, um, you know, in politics as well as in the military, serve to obfuscate the the um, you know the dire nature of what you're doing or the very serious nature of what you're doing. Like sure. you know, you said you know, like we're going to do a raid. Or we're going to do a reconnaissance mission, or we're going to do, you know, I don't know, surveil the area, or you know, or neutralize the target. I don't know these these terms. It's amazing how you can say that, and and it, it's almost like it robs um, the message of what you really want to do. We want to hunt down, you know, these group of people, and you know, maybe murder whoever gets in our way. And, you know, and, and it's just amazing. Like, it, it's the same thing in politics, you know, calling something taxation instead of theft, right? Calling something yeah. quantitative easing instead of um, sure. counterfeiting, right? Sure. Call, you know, and, and, you know, there's so many euphemisms um, that exist that really numb people's minds to what's happening, you know? And the other thing I was going to say is that um, when you said, you know, we're in perpetual war, it really um, reminds you of 1984 about, yeah. like, like you know, we've been in war. I mean, I mean, what since when? Uh, I, I don't know, eighties or nineties or you know, the since then, you know, and at least and <laughs> yeah, at least and and it's it's just like now so nonstop and and people don't even think about it anymore. You know, people just go on with their daily lives and they're like, well, that's reality. You know, um, but <laughs> and it's helpful. I mean, I mean, one thing I don't want to do too often when I talk about this kind of stuff is dwell on the dark. And the negative, because that's one thing that that I get a lot anyway, is like, you know, you're so negative. You're just looking at the bad things in life. You know, why don't you focus <laughs> on the good things? And it's true. There's a lot of good things that are going on. But we yes. can't forget that, you know, people are murdering other human beings in the name of government. Right. Mm. You know, you, you can't just look over that. <laughs> sure. 
And no, I think go ahead. like Sorry. <laughs> what you're saying too about one, the euphemisms and how you can cover or, or change the meaning of, of something like the military is probably one of the most efficient organizations at doing that. I mean, we don't call targets targets. We call them HVT is a high value target. So you're talking about taking out an HVT mm-hmm. instead of human. Right, exactly. Well, and um, even though you're watching this happen through a grainy or a very clear video, as it may be, <laughs> um, you know, everything about this situation that has led you to that moment has trained you and prepared you for the fact that like, this is something that just needs to die. Like you don't, mm-hmm. um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to share something that I'm, I'm really ashamed of, but, uh, I think this will be a good illustration of, of how efficiently that happens. And let me start with a little backstory, you know, even at the Academy, when you're just a little cadet, um, before you ever go anywhere to fight any wars, you watch all these pump up videos and they're set to that stupid song, let the bodies hit the floor. And it's, um, so this loud blaring music is playing and you're watching, you know, bombs hit targets and bombs hit buildings. And, you know, everybody in the room around you is just so psyched and amped about it. Cause it's made out to be very, very glorious and, um, like a very, um, good thing. And, you know, you can't help but pick up on the energy around that. And, and you get that from day one. Um, you really do, you know, the, uh, the situation I want to tell you about, though, is happens many years later, you know, after I've been in maybe a, a community like this where we talk about people and we don't say the word people or we don't use the word human or yeah. uh, we do um, missions and we, we take out HVTs or HVIs or whatever it happens to be. But I, I distinctly remember one mission where we were watching a, a hit happen. So a hit is when Um, you either have guys, you know, land on the ground and physically raid a place or you call in an airstrike and, and bomb the building. And in this instance, it was an HVI, a high value individual who, uh, for whatever reason had been associated at some point with, uh, terrorism in some instance. And that's a really, really blurry gray extended line that we can talk about, but Mm -hmm. trying to go after this guy. Um, there's like a, F-16 on station, they drop a bomb, they like miss the guy. And we're watching this on a camera and you see like the bomb impact and then you see a person running away from it. And everybody's like, oh no, you know, he's a squirter. That's what we call it. You know, if somebody squirts out of the uh, explosion, like they made it. So now we have to chase down the squirters. And I just distinctly remember watching this guy like running and rolling and falling down a hill as like more and more bombs and, uh, bombs are following him. And at the time, you know, everybody around me, cause we're watching this, uh, together, it's like, Oh, you know, you gotta get them, gotta get them. And it's like this joking, like macabre theater of, of some sort that, um, didn't really strike me until much later. Looking back at that situation, I was really ashamed of how I felt because I, it, all I was thinking about was, you know, they've got to get this guy. They've got to get a guy they missed. Oh, shit, they better try again. Like, better luck next time. And then when you step out of it and you're like, oh, that's somebody's father. Like, okay, well, maybe he was a really bad guy. But then you think half of the people, you know, everybody in this country, um, you're going after a bunch of, like, farmers or teenagers or young people who are just pissed off because you're in their backyard and you're burning their crops and or raiding their homes and you're shooting their dogs and taking their fathers. Like none of these people were involved with 9-11. Um, half of them probably think we're the Russians, you know, they, they don't even realize, um, what, what's going on. You know, there are some villages out there that are so isolated. Um, they, they have no clue what 9-11 happened. All they know is that there's a foreign country here that's, uh, destroying their livelihoods and, and, and they're angry. And a lot of the people we would go after, were associated with um, IEDs, so improvised explosive devices. And these are things where, yeah, maybe uh, some of your listeners aren't familiar, but, you know, they can be remotely detonated and, you know, blow up. And they're a really big problem for our troops in Iraq. And and the same was in Afghanistan. So 
uh, big problem, right? Like our, our army guys, our Marine guys are, are vulnerable on the ground to these IEDs. So we go out and we try to hunt down people that are associated with planting them or building them or anything. We call them IED facilitators. So you think about it though. It's like, okay, well that makes sense. IEDs are bad. You know, we should, anybody messing around with them should, is not a good person. But when you take a bigger step back, you say, look, you know, an IED really isn't a problem. If you're in your own backyard, like, right. why why are these army guys stepping on IEDs over here? Like, what are, what are we doing in Afghanistan? And once you start asking those questions and you don't have that faith anymore that um, <laughs> that you're there for a good reason, it becomes really difficult to uh, keep doing what you're doing. Um, it's tough. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I talk, I don't talk to too many people about, you know, I guess, you know, foreign policy like mm-hmm. you know the war on terror because well first of all especially if i'm talking to a veteran <laughs> i don't have the credentials to talk to somebody <laughs> like that because they're just going to be to say you don't know what i've been through so I, I just can't even go there but um but just talking to everyone else it's like you know i i tell people that um you know these people let's say these, these group of hijackers and i mean i mean who knows who did it right i mean so but let's just assume it's like what's the 19 saudi arabian guys you know hijacked mm-hmm. planes and and, and hit you know, different various places and they died. Okay. So now what, what's going to happen? Like, so 3000 people die. And so now going over there for what, like 15 years now, um, and killing over a million people is, does that justify, you know, no. does that mean we're equal? Like, like <laughs> right? it's, it's like, it's like if somebody, you know, were to, um, or, or if, you know, if I were to, murder somebody and then their family were to come and not only kill my whole family but kill the block my yeah. na- all of my neighbors <laughs> the sure. entire block probably even the entire county just bomb everybody yeah. um and uh and it's just uh it's collectivist thinking it's like everybody's to blame sure. everybody's you know associated and it's just to me it's just so indicative of the status mindset of like everybody is a group. We're all a group. No, there's no individuals. You know, you got the Muslims. You know, you got the Americans, <laughs> and everyone's a group, and everyone's to blame. And 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 so you can easily justify that. I I can see that for for people that are in the military. You know, um, well, it's just not. It's not justice. Like that situation you're describing is not justice. Yeah. Like, you know, it was it was a terrible, terrible crime that 3,000 Americans died on 9-11. Like, right. that's a big deal. Right. Um, you know, the correct response would be appropriate. And it's like, okay, this is a crime. Like, let's handle it. Um, like, within a, within a justice system. Like, hunt down the people that are actually responsible. Mm-hmm. And, like, bring them to trial in a court of justice. And, like, you should have plenty of evidence to to make your case you know the answer is not let's use this as a pretext for invading three countries and you know creating regime change in another and it's just what we're doing is not even related to that anymore the people that we've been at war with in afghanistan and iraq and africa and all sorts of other places had nothing to do with that i mean it's just this monster that's really spiraled out of control yeah, and the other, and the other point I like to mention is um, the word defense, right? When you, <laughs> when you defend something, are you like going across town? <laughs> yeah. Right? Or are you staying at your in your own property and defending your property? <laughs> yeah. That's the definition of defense. Um, no, <laughs> and, actually, yeah, I have an article on that called um, Oxymorons from a Foreign Policy Perspective, and it was just all these words that just get twisted. Mm -hmm. Uh, defense isn't defense anymore. And that's really when I came across the non-aggression principle was like, holy shit, like nothing I've done in my military career thus far, like my entire adult life that I've been so proud of everything I've done, like hasn't been in defense, like, holy shit. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. and there's like one small clarification. We have something called like a tactical view versus a strategic view. Um, tactical is like, you're looking, it's, it's small. It's what's happening now. What's this particular mission on this day at this time where strategic is why, you know, what's the big picture and the overall goal. And I would say that in war 
defense happens like in small one-on-one encounters like hey i'm on one side of the trenches you're on the other you run at me with a knife i'm going to defend myself right, right like there are billions of small instances like that where tactically speaking defense is occurring mm-hmm. but uh, and that's what i you know that's what i saw like i'd be watching a, a group of army dudes um walk through the mountains at night and if somebody came to attack them like they'd fight back and we'd help them and we'd you know facilitate that but then when you look at it from the strategic overall view, it's like, well, why are your army dudes walking around in the mountains at 8,000 <laughs> feet, you know, 8,000 miles away from where they are? Right. Um, so from a tactical view, it's like, okay, some of this stuff is okay. But um, strategically, like the big picture, the foundational goal is is all wrong. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and we've got a guest. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> this is Rebecca. She needs milk. <laughs> Rebecca. I don't know if you listen to Prop CJ, Dangerous History Podcast. No. Um, awesome. He's an anarchist historian. And mm-hmm. um, I've been listening to him for a couple months now. And and he um, he did one episode last uh, last year at Christmas um, about the Christmas truce of uh, December 1914. I don't yep. know if you heard about that. that yep. Uh, World War One, and yep. um, And he was basically saying how um since then the the military has really focused on dehumanizing first of all dehumanizing uh the enemy it's like mm-hmm. making them like not human right just just yep. insulting them demeaning them belittling them you know and and then um also making the um like basically trying to beat out the humanity of human sure. beings and make them into killing machines right so that mm-hmm. w- they would follow an order um like it's a lower motor neuron reflex like it wouldn't yeah. even reach the brain you know <laughs> like a knee jerk response right and and that was that 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 december 1914 christmas truce really set into motion that and and how and how he was saying recently um uh the incidence of uh, of ptsd has been really, really, um, um, you know, ramped up, and not only that, but also, also the um, the the use of machines, like like um, like air, uh, helicopters and and you know jets and things like that. So 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 now, compared to that time, troops see much more combat they do now than they used to, right? In World War One, and uh, you know even World War Two. So and that's another thing, you know, that's like, um, and, and it's just amazing how. How like people, you know, you know, the pe- the kind of people that say like that human beings are, you know, naturally evil and nasty and, and you know, you know, without the government, without laws, they would, you know, just ex- take advantage of you and, and steal you and assault you and things like that. And you can just see that that's not the case because you see how to what lengths the military has to go right. to try to beat out the sure. humanity of people and try to make them into killing machines that don't think right. And and that don't question the orders. No, I mean, you're absolutely right. Like there are always going to be people that are troublemakers or want to do bad things to other people. But by and large, I think the natural state of your average person is, is peace. And that's one thing I I do. I'm grateful for my time in the military is I, I traveled around the world. And when you do that, you see that people are just like you, like their concern is, making a good life for their family. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, when I make uh, certain posts on Facebook about this kind of stuff, um, some uh, some veterans that, you know, are, are still in the status mindset, you know, they say like, well, the, the military, it's not only about like, you know, violating people's human rights and, you know, killing and bombing people, sure. bombing their buildings and their homes. You know, we're also building, we're, we're building bridges and <laughs> roads and we're helping, you know, in the church in their churches and we're doing all this stuff um so what the you, building roads for you <laughs> what do you right so so what do you say to somebody that would say that to you uh, so there's a great analogy for that and i can't remember where i picked it up but there was basically a, a study done at a at a nuclear facility and these researchers went in and they were asking all the employees hey you know what's the worst part about your job and the answers they got back were, you know, our computer programming stinks or our processes are all wrong, they're not efficient, or, you know, we don't have enough vacation time or the HR department stinks, you know, things like that. And not 
the these researchers were appalled that not one person said, "Hey, maybe the work that I'm doing is is contributing towards the demise of humanity." Mm-hmm. Um, and that really struck a chord with me because, like I said, there were there are many things on a on a small basis that are are good that we're doing that you know at face value you say, "Yeah, this is a good thing. This is this is okay." And um, but when you step back and, you know, even if your job is is handing out towels at the gym, like the organization that you're a part of um, is still ultimately engaged in in death and, and destruction. And, you know, they they really harp on one team, one fight, you know, unifying everybody towards this one mission. They just, you know, don't don't really make it clear what the mission is or they don't put it in. They couch it. You know, they they cushion it with nice phrases and. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so that's, that's what I would say is, you know, no matter like what you're doing, like you have to look at what are the ultimate goals of the organization I'm working for. And I'd say people should do that in the private sector as well, but in the military, I mean, it's pretty clear. Um, your job is, is to basically go where people tell you and do what other people tell you. And, and a lot of times that that's violence. So. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and 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 one example that people tell me to prove that not all um, people in the military are are immoral or committing immoral mm-hmm. acts is like, um, like, well, what about the guy who's the medic who goes mm-hmm. out in the field and helps the soldiers? What about what about the guy who uh, cleans the drones? The guy who <laughs> just wi- he wipes them down, makes them nice and shiny. Sure. Is, is he is he an immoral guy? <laughs> and and like you said. You have to step back and see not just what you're doing, but what is your the goal of the organization that you work what you for? Work towards you, <laughs> like what are you spending eight hours of your life every day working towards? <laughs> it's uh, and when you look at it from that point of view, it's quite different. Right, right. Like, um, like my sister in law is uh, she studied accounting, and and you know I, you know I could say like. Like even there was there was people in the in the Nazi regime that were accountants, right? <laughs> that managed their money, right? Were they sure. immoral people? Sure. Like like you know like people can always give this this um, rationalization. You know, I'm just doing my job, but that that's really a cop out. It's like no, use your. Even hold up the Nuremberg trials. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I was just doing my job. So so you know, really, you got to step back and you know use your brain and and you know employ some critical thinking and like wait a minute, like what am I supporting sure. with my time and my labor? You know. Yep. No, you're exactly right. It's like at what point are you not okay being a tool for something else? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's what I felt like it's like I don't want to just be a cog because this wheel is is going someplace I don't want to be. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> get off the wheel. <laughs> definitely, definitely. So, so, um, all right. So, can we discuss a little bit about your um, "Are You Really Free" series and just uh, talk a little bit about what uh, what you were talking about in that? Uh sure. So that's um, the "Are You Really Free." It's part of our, our Liberty Bug blog, which is something my husband and I started um, before we got out even, just as a forum to start talking about some of these issues. And um, one of the things we do is, are you really free? And we'll go and we look at news articles from around the country that demonstrate um, when you put them together that we say this is the land of the free and the brave, but here you are, you you can't um, put certain things in your body, you know, that are illegal or you must do this. You know, we try to find a lot of compulsory things. Uh, compulsion is the worst. <laughs> um, and it's basically a wrap up of, of different articles um, and current events that demonstrate, you know, this, this may be a, a wonderful place to live, but is this true freedom? Um, and just, it's just a tool to get people thinking um, a little bit more critically. Um, I think that's important because if you can, Take somebody like me who I feel was somewhat brainwashed and, you know, I think I'm fairly intelligent, but I can spend 10 years um, engaged in, in military warfare without thinking critically about it. If you can take somebody in that position and get them to, to where I am now, where uh, <laughs> it's 180 degrees out, like there's hope for a lot of people to, to come to this message of non-aggression. Yeah, it reminds me of um, Julie Borowski's um, post on Facebook. Um, she said, like, it, it, she was like, um, kind of uh, making fun of the movie um, Anarchy: The Purge, 
And I haven't seen that. <laughs> well, good. Don't see it. <laughs> because <laughs> okay. you can imagine a Hollywood movie with that name, what, what it would be about. Yeah, it's, it's basically about, um, like, you know, it's a horror movie, right? And the government yeah, it's shuts... It's just one where, like, one night a year... Right. Get... Okay, that sounded yeah. terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They shut down, like, the government. All laws are suspended for, like, I don't know, 24 hours or something. And, <laughs> and of course, you know, gangs pop up. Everyone's r- raping and murdering each other and assaulting and everything. And just chaos and bloodshed and all that and uh you know status dream <laughs> you know or, or this conception of what you know what happened with our government um and so and so julie Brodsky, she posted on facebook um if if uh if all laws were suspended for let's say 12 hours mm-hmm. what would you do <laughs> <laughs> i would clearly become like uh crap- <laughs> and murder people <laughs> and and it's so funny the uh the, the the comments at the top that got the most likes were like um um, open a lemonade stand. Um, <laughs> <laughs> drink raw milk. Um, <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, um, what was the other one? Um, make additions to my house. <laughs> uh, go fishing. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's funny. You know, uh, it's true though. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like what what kind of uh, evil, sadistic human beings you think mm. people are that they need? You know you know um scribbles written by politicians on capitol hill to keep them in line and civil and decent with one another you know uh, yeah it's, i mean it's really kind of a a cynical concept like i know you said you get accused of being uh, on the dark side and stuff but really like what's the more cynical position that like people need boundaries for them to treat each other well like some people might like there i think there will always be some people that are you know have bad intentions but <laughs> it's really a, a sad view of humanity if if the state is required yeah yeah definitely and and the other thing is that um i, I think it's helpful to point out to people especially when you talk about foreign policy is that um we um as uh you know peaceful human beings have more in common with the average iraqi a- afghanistan yep. uh, you know afghani and iranian mm-hmm. than we do with our own political masters here in the united yep. states and and it's so important for people to realize that because, um, you know, too often we can get so divided by such, you know, absurd things like religion, like nationality, mm-hmm. you know, gender, creed, ethnicity, you know, all these kind of reasons to divide people when, in fact, you have to realize that so many, we all have, you know, most people have basically the same aspirations, you know. You want to, you know, settle down, you know, meet, meet somebody that you fall in love with, you know, yeah. earn enough money to support your family, have kids, you know, give them a good education. You know, you want them to have a good life and, you know, basic stuff like that. That's basically what most people want all so over the world. people around the world want. You know, and, 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 and it's amazing how, how statism is, is founded in fear, fear of the unknown, oh. right? Fear of your neighbor fear of that country that r- strange religion fear of you know everybody you know that's the only way they stay in power is by is by uh propagating this fear no yeah, i mean i think you'd see that a lot in like the current uh campaigning <laughs> the, yeah he's a boogeyman yeah 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 like uh you know with the wall and <laughs> trump's wall um it's like it's like you yeah. can you can draw parallels to the berlin wall you know, to, to there was like a wall that was put up in in uh, in in uh, Nazi Germany, <laughs> like you know, there's so many so many ways to divide people, and it's, and it's just amazing there, how. Say again. Oh, I said I was just agreeing with you. There, there definitely are, um, yeah. and that's what the state capitalizes on. Yeah, yeah, fear, fear, and and when you when you begin to understand that people, you know, we all are basically the same, you know, have similar aspirations. We're not all that different, you know. It's like it's like especially now with the internet, you can you can go onto Facebook, friend somebody, friend request somebody in uh, in Iraq or Afghanistan, or, or Skype with them and talk with them and say, do you want to come here and like blow up buildings? Like, <laughs> no. Why do you ask? I don't know because. Yeah. I, I I was watching my TV and that's what they said you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, there's a, a great quote I came across that said travel is the fastest way to peace. Um, and I, I loved that because it's just when you meet people from other places, um, that's when you actually realize that. And that's when that lesson becomes clear is, you know, 
when you see how other people are living and all they want to do is provide for their families and, you know, have a nice little life, you know, they're not interested in, in engaging in any of this crime, you know, same, they're just the same as you are. Um, yeah. That, that realization is, is truly maybe one of the fastest ways to peace. Like the quote says. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I've done a, I've done a fair amount of traveling. Um, and, uh, and my, my grandparents recently went to Russia for the first time. Oh, cool. And and now and the first thing they said that I remember they come, they came back and they said, um, it's amazing to go there because, you know, especially during the cold war, you know, we were taught to hate these people, Sure. You know, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and, and you're right. It's just amazing how, yeah, yes, statism thrives on just, you know, um, erecting these walls, these barriers, yeah. you know, and, sure. and, and just, you know, love and compassion and kindness can just, I think, break through all of that. And I think that's what we have to realize. That's what we have to demonstrate to people what volunteerism and anarchy is about, right? Because, you know, so much, especially the word anarchy has such negative connotations, and so, yeah. and so, you, you know, you really have to say, uh, I, I tell them that, you know, this is a, this is a philosophy about love, about compassion, you know, sure. about, about advocate. We're not just, we're not just anti-state, anti-government, anti-laws, but we're pro-freedom and pro-love, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Consensual relationships. It's a wonderful thing. <laughs> yeah. And it's amazing. You know, when you put it, when you put, when you put it in that way, like who can be against consensual relationships, right? What kind of yeah. person? <laughs> It's, um, it, it, yeah, I mean, like once you come across it, like I, I haven't found any compelling arguments to, to come take me away from non-aggression, you know, as kind of your, my, my founding principle. And then, you know, the logical follow on is, well, you know, everybody should have this. And, you know, that's really all an anarchist society is, is, uh, to me, a place where self-sovereignty is recognized and, <laughs> You know, non-aggression is recognized. Oh, yeah. And that's it. <laughs> it's, like, really simple. And when you put it in terms like that, like, yeah. hey, you shouldn't be coerced into anything. You shouldn't be compelled to, to act against your will. Like, right. I think a lot of people can get behind that. All right. Okay, so, so before we go, can you talk about your um, approach to peaceful parenting as, uh, well, as, <laughs> as demonstrated with your little one? <laughs> well, so um, the non-aggression principle... Um, changed my life professionally, uh, obviously with leaving the military and then personally it's, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I like to, I strive for consistency in my life. So, um, I, I want to treat my daughters like their bodies are their own and teach them autonomy. And, um, I don't want to teach them that might makes right. Like we as a nation tend to do. Mm -hmm. So, um, for me, it's, it kind of just made sense. It's a logical follow on from my um, overall philosophy that uh, I mean, it's a struggle though. <laughs> no, it is. There, there are times I have a toddler and I, I know you've been through this phase before, but it's like, I just need you to obey, like just be obedient, please. And <laughs> do what I'm telling you to do. Cause just do it. <laughs> you <know? Yeah. laughs> um, sometimes, you know, I joke that it's like, um, negotiating with terrorists. So it's, <laughs> um, I think the, the peaceful parenting has, been one of the most humbling and most challenging um, experiences I've had when uh, you really want to live out this thing, like put your money where your mouth is. And it's like, we're not, oh, we're not going to do things that are, um, that, that don't make sense. You know, my, my job as a parent is to, to shepherd these young women and, and to demonstrate to them how. All right. So we had some technical difficulties, <laughs> but we're back online. Um, so before we go, please plug some of your, uh, your information if people want to reach you and, uh, you know, check out your podcast. All right. So uh, like Danilo mentioned earlier, our website is called libertybug.org. We've got a Facebook page under that name as well. That's a great way to reach uh, my husband and I. Um, I'm on Twitter as Anarchomama. That's M-A-M-A. -A. <laughs> and um, we're uh, especially interested in talking to people. Oh, got a crime baby. But uh, we're especially uh, interested in talking to anybody who might be curious about volunteerism or um, anarchism or the military, um, because it is quite a different environment to come from. And we've spent, uh, 20 years combined <laughs> in it. So, mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're more than happy to, to reach out and, and help kind of share our experience or the resources that helped, uh, us make some important decisions. 
Yes. Also. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So we'll, let's get it. Let, let's uh, let her get back to peaceful parenting. Uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. That... awesome. Awesome to right. see an infant on my show. <laughs> I have two kids. Thanks my, so much, Danilo. I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old, so I love I love kids. Um, yeah, this is going quickly, but uh, it, I mean, it's. It only serves to heighten the importance of, of what we're doing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that's the best way to eradicate statism is by raising, you know, loving, peaceful, gentle, compassionate yep. human beings. Uh, you know, you can you can try to convince somebody and de deprogram them, decondition them, but you know that's very very difficult compared to raising sure. raising people the right way. Um, yep. So they're not broken adults, right? <laughs> um, I absolutely agree. It's the most important job. <laughs> oh my God! It's and it's so undervalued. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, awesome conversation, uh, Jessica. Thank you very much for coming on. I really appreciate Thanks, it. Jessica. Um, so if anybody wants to help me out, you can do so through PayPal, Bitcoin, or Patreon. That's Patreon. Uh, dot com slash peaceful anarchism to help me out and help me out uh, interviewing uh, wonderful people like Jessica here uh, spread the message of volunteerism in in their own way so uh, thank you very much for that and so we'll say goodbye this is uh, peaceful anarchism on the voluntary virtues network and the seeds of liberty dot com and the conscious resistance dot com wishing everyone have a wonderful day take care bye <laughs>